So this afternoon, we're going to talk about cybersecurity. How do we balance the cost with the risk? Uh, I want to make one administrative announcement before we get started here, and that is that this is one of the sessions at West that has been awarded a continuing education unit. Any of you who are preserving your certification, uh, you need to check in with us to make sure that uh, we validate your presence at this session so you get your CEU. Okay, my job here is to introduce our moderator. That's a pretty easy job for me because uh, I've known uh, Herb Brown for a long time. Turns out he's actually my predecessor as uh, president and CEO of FCA. He's been in the defense business for a while, served in the United States Navy from 1964 to 2000. I won't tell you where I was in 1964, but it wasn't in the Navy. Uh, he has served uh, around the world in a variety of theaters. He has commanded at every level from squadron to ship to uh, including the aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy, uh, commanded a carrier battle group, and was commander of the U.S. Third Fleet. Uh, we all know uh, as well that uh, Admiral Brown was, uh, was the deputy commander out at, uh, out at Space Command. And uh, I guarantee he knows our business. He's been a member of AFCEA for something like 25 years now. And uh, so he certainly knows the association, and I think he's been a member of the U.S. Naval Institute since he was an ensign. And so, uh, so he certainly knows our business, and he knows, uh, he knows cyber, and he's enlisted a tremendous panel here today to talk about this subject. So without further ado, Thank Herb. You. Thank you very much, Ken. I, uh, <laughs> I'm really pleased to know that you're going to get education credit for this. I wasn't smart enough to go to the War College. My wife was. But then it remarkably, kind of like the reason I got this job to, to, to moderate this panel today and the reason I got to go to the War College occasionally, I got the senior that nobody knew what to do with me, so they would just send me up there to give speeches. So I wasn't smart enough to go, but I was smart enough to go to give speeches. Thanks to both Naval Institute and AFCEA, West is unquestionably next to Christmas and the National Finals Rodeo, my very favorite week of the year. What a great opportunity to learn, and I think that is the key the key for the event, as far as I'm concerned, you learn on the exhibit floor, you learn from magnificent panel members like those who are here today. Uh, cybersecurity, how do we balance the cost with the risk? It's exactly the right question. It's the question that we knew was going to come eventually. It certainly hit every other warfare area, and it's probably about time that we start thinking about that, and I'm sure our panel members have been thinking about it for a few years. Uh, yesterday, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Under Secretary of the Navy both suggested that cyber funding was going to be level or maybe even a slight uh, increase. And that's, that's probably very, very good news. Why? Because they also sent the signal very, very clearly that uh, cybersecurity is a key war fighting priority and it's a new center of gravity. We've got to be able to secure our networks to even come close to fighting the way uh, that we train. Each of our four panel members has three decades, even at young whippersnapper Marine, of, of communications, cyber warfare, cyber, cyber warriors. So there are three decade cyber warriors. And my number right there, that, that adds up to about 120 years of experience. And, uh, they are, in fact, the leaders who are going to be responsible and who are responsible at this very moment for achieving this balance between uh, cost and risk. And frankly, hopefully in the remarks, if not, then maybe in, uh, in the discussion that we'll allow, have, allow you to do after they've had a few minutes, uh, they can even help us try to define cost and risk. Is cost time? Is cost dollars? What is it? Is risk, is risk failure, is risk re the, the possibility of, of losing our people? Th those are all great questions, and uh, 
think about those things as you go throughout uh, throughout hearing them remark. I've asked, actually asked them to talk for about 10 minutes each. I, I, we normally say five minutes, but I've never seen one that could, could get his message across in five minutes. So I, I've asked them <laughs> to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm gonna, we'll just go from left to right. I'm gonna, let me give you a quick, very quick introduction of these uh, marvelous, as it turns out, men, but these cyber warriors. First, uh, uh, Rear Admiral Bob Day, uh, United States Coast Guard is the Assistant Commandant, Command Control Communications Computers and CIO and Director of the Coast Guard Cyber Command Pre-Commissioning Detachment. Uh, he is an electrical engineer, a communicator, very obviously a leader. Uh, as you read his bio, he is one of those who's first on scene at the natural disasters to, to set up communications and, and, and uh, has done a great deal for our nation. As at, as a member of the Homeland Security. So hopefully we'll get a look at a non-DOD, get a look at, at the Coast Guard and the Department of Homeland Security when we start talking about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, following uh, the Admiral, uh, Brigadier General Kevin Nally, who is the Deputy CIO, Department of the Navy, and the Director of Command Control Communications Computers, United States Marine Corps a professional communicator, and if you read his bio, and I'm sure you all have, also a professional trainer. He trains in martial arts and all kinds of stuff, but he's a professional trainer as well as being a professional communicator. Uh, he's a, like all Marines, is a warrior that's got a, a boot full of sand from, uh, from that part of the world where we send all of our Marines at one time or another. Uh, the general will be followed by Mr. Terry Halverson, uh, Terry is the CIO of the Department of the Navy. Uh, Terry is our department's senior advisor on information management, information technology, cyberspace, information resource management. Uh, he provides strategic policy and plans, advice directly to the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, we stole uh, uh, Terry from, uh, from the United States Army, a real coup for us and for us sailors and it was in the Army where he really <coughs> cut his surface, service to nation teeth. He'll be followed by Mr. Rob Carey, who's the Deputy CIO of the Department of Defense. Uh, Rob focuses on leading the consolidation and standardization of the defense information technology enterprise architecture. Enormous job and, and cert <coughs> certainly something that is needed. I'd like to see it reach beyond the Department of Defense if it was possible. He's a former uh, Department of the Navy CIO. Uh, we also stole him from the Army where he started his uh, federal service. Uh, and not only did we steal him from the Army to come to, the, to, uh, to be an SCS as he is today, he's also in the Navy Reserve, a captain who has served again in Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. So again, we're going to ask each of these members, and I'm just going to pass it down the line, starting with, uh, with Admiral Day, speak for a few moments about cost and risk as they see it from their desk, and then we're going to open it up to you for questions. It's a lot better if you ask questions than I do, but I've got 72 of them right here in case you want to just sit there and be a, a, a non-participant. Okay. Don't make Herb ask the questions. Um, Herb, you brought up a couple interesting points. You know, one of them uh, being is, okay, uh, a look at the non-DOD side. Well, uh, thanks to Terry and uh, the Department of the Navy, uh, the Coast Guard, as most of you know, the Fifth Armed Services, I'm sponsored by Terry and the Navy as a member of the dot mill community. So I live mainly on that side. But at the same time, I also have several different uh, obligations being a component under the Department of Homeland Security now just a little over a decade old and uh, dealing with pressures that are coming from both sides. And again, it comes down to this cost versus risk equation. I don't think anybody here will disagree on the risk equation. We know what it is. And uh, the, th the, th the translation becomes is how do you take that risk and look at it from an operational standpoint? Because that's what I do. I'm supposed to support operators. But the risk piece becomes more present to me when a Coast Guard cutter says, you know, I'll get underway with one diesel engine, but I will not get underway if I don't have my full dot mill connectivity going out and doing missions. 
Uh, to me, that says, you know, we have elevated cyber in terms of relevance towards operations because it is now the nexus by which the information gets out to do and execute the mission. That said, we still have to take a look at the cost side of it, and, and more so in this day and age as we are all going through the various different uh, budget drills that we're doing each and every day 24-7. Uh, but there's also some other cost parts of it. But uh, let me just take and put my CIO hat on versus being uh, the cyber commander, which is an, a unique position for me in that uh, as a cyber component commander under U.S. Cyber Command, I can talk to myself as the CIO and saying, you really should do that. And I look at myself, yes, I probably really should. I really never not uh, win them one of those arguments where I have the cyber hat and on the CIO. But the question is, is cybersecurity for me uh, some recent examples I'll tell you about, it's a cost avoidance. Because what we've done is over the last couple of decades is built very quickly and very rapidly in response to demands from the warfighter, from our administrative and our support entities to build out these systems very, very quickly, sometimes in a very non-structured format. And what I'm finding is I've recently found with the new cyber capabilities that we have, the ability to look into our network, see better what's going on, and find out what's happening is configuration management is not where it needs to be. And that's an issue. And it becomes a cost issue. I'll give you a perfect example. Because of flexibility that was provided in the past to allow operators in the field, and again, these are operators that work in my chain of command and information technology, to take and build servers in some non-standard formats every now and then, it's very difficult to quickly push patches out when they don't take the same in the entire environment. What happens there is a recent example is, is public fo or private folders were um, visible across for about 9,000 people on the network. What should have been a very quick software push out to the field to close that uh, discrepancy took months, which results in potential massive PII spills, which if anybody's dealt with that now, is a significant cost factor to be able to do it. Literally, I had to offer 9,000 members the opportunity to have credit monitoring for at least a year. That's a cost factor. It's expensive. It's not cheap. And it evolved from non-standard configuration management and somewhat of an inattention to security. So there's a cost avoidance there that implementing the new tools that uh, are being given to us from DISA, from U.S. Cyber Command, host-based security systems, driving people back into configuration management will allow us to avoid some of those things. The other cost is going to be a cultural perspective. Some people don't want us to make these changes. Some people don't want us to be able to tighten up the configuration of these systems, which we're going to need to do. It somewhat limits the flexibility, you know, applications that were built on the fly that necessarily didn't have all the security built into them, you know, a decade ago or even as much as recently, are probably not going to operate. And is this balancing act, because we've got to support the warfighter, and some of those tools, they're in their hands and very important to their mission. But at the same time, I've got to push for that. Um, those cultural pieces, the one is the CIO. I end up being the most hated person around town when I have to go down and tell somebody, hey, we're taking this offline because you can't meet these requirements. The other piece is, is all of us have U.S. Cyber and DISA looking over our shoulder day in and day out. You get a scan on one of your units that has multiple Cat1 vulnerabilities, you get a cease and desist order that if you don't fix it within 30 days, you're disconnected from the grid, no matter what the operational impact. So is this yin and yang that we're going to have to figure out on how to do this, how to get the cultures in place such people understand that some of these legacy systems are going to have to go and drive them down into these portfolios such that we only have things that do meet this environment. The other piece is, is it's going to change our workforce. Our workforce has to change. Um, as we start collapsing these environments, whether it be data center consolidations, services, these types of things, the far-flung server spaces that we have all over um, our organization are not going to need those people there to manage and monitor those servers. Now, I take it back, those forward deployed people are still going to need to do that. You know, you cannot outsource and data center 
uh, in cases many times these dismounted units that have to operate independently and we have to figure out how to bring that in. So there's multiple uh, cost versus uh, risk pieces that are going to be put into place. Workforce, um, just the pure cost of doing it, and then those culture changes that are going to evolve as we start moving to these new environments. Because the bottom line is the risk is there and we have to close it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Kevin? First, I want to thank FCA for hosting this conference. It's a great conference. So for Mr. Snyder and General Dubia, wherever you are, and Mike Warlick, thank you for hosting it. This is probably my second favorite FCA conference. Hawaii is probably my favorite. So please don't count that next year. So you all vendors, please keep coming. I'll be there. I um, mean, I want to thank, too, the IT industry, because I know I meet with the vast majority of you either here or, or in the Pentagon. And if it wasn't for you all uh, keeping me abreast of what your product does, and how it can be employed on our Marine Corps Enterprise Network and keep me up to date on <clears throat> current technology. I appreciate it very much. I'm not going to talk about cost savings in cybersecurity because to me that's probably the least important issue that I have. I'm more concerned about command and control <clears throat> than mission assurance. So the single most important return on investment to me is <clears throat> in cybersecurity is how can it deliver mission assurance for our war fighters. That's the first most important thing to me. And in my day-to-day -day life and in keeping with the Commandant's priorities, there's no import, more important phone call that I get from our Marines in Afghanistan or aboard uh, our ships with the Navy at, as part of a Mueller or an ARG. So I first look at the mission assurance piece. Uh, how, and we look at what's the best products that are the most effective products for the least amount of resources required to implement. That's my first and foremost priority, and how, it, how will it affect command and control for the uh, commanders. And then <clears throat> I don't think the network is that, well, the network is important, but I don't, I think we rely on it too much. I think what's more important is the data that's contained, transported, and received on our networks. I think we need to look at taking the data that we want to completely secure and put it in really secure enclaves and then the rest of the data out there is just, okay, if you steal it, you steal it. It's not that important to us. And I firmly believe that IP addresses are clearly public knowledge, public, inf public knowledge and public information. And I stress to people, if you go on the internet, you have to just assume that your information is going to be stolen or exploited or taken advantage of. So look at secure enclaves. <clears throat> I think in terms of command and control across the five uh, domains is that we need to build in uh, resiliency as well because we need to get back to training the warfighters how to fight without a network. Now in our, our Afghanistan and formerly Iraq, Marines that rotated in and out of the AOR, the area of responsibility, fell in on existing facilities, fell in on existing networks, and now we're getting back into the training mode of, well, you're going to hit a beach somewhere, or be deployed somewhere, or fly in, and you're going to have to re recreate a network beginning with a single channel radio. So we, we need to concentrate more on the command and control piece. And then we stress, too, is what I call the five W's, if I can remember all five of them. It's what do I know, who else needs to know it, what's the fastest way to get it to them, what format do they need it, and, and once they receive it, do they understand it and know what to do with it. So you take the data, turn it into information, take the information, turn it into knowledge, actionable knowledge that the commanders on the ground and the uh, youngest warfighters have the knowledge that can make actionable decisions. Uh, and I think we, what we also need to do too, and I use this as an example from <clears throat> a couple cyber exercises is the red team will get up and brief, they did this and this, this t to the network, the good guys will get up and brief, everything was green. So you sit there and you say, well, if the red guy said this and the green guy said this, then what's the real impact of cyber? You know, because the operator said they can still operate in it. So I think in DOD we need to do a better job of explaining what the vulner not just what the vulnerability is, but how it's going to impact on our mission. Uh, that's, what you, that's what we need to do better to our, to our operators, our operations officers and staff. And two more quick points, uh, or maybe three. The more I think we can automate the process, the better with fewer resources and fewer people. 
and it's easy to train and educate them to be able to use it. And then it, cybersecurity has to be more clearly linked with the mission requirements and mission assurance and how it would affect the command and control. And when you say command and control, when I say command and control, it's not so much the network. The network is, the command is an authority given to an individual to be in charge of a certain amount of people or organization. The control piece, the network's one piece of that. You have people, facilities, you have equipment, you have a network, uh, maintenance requirements, et cetera. So the network's one piece of that, and I think we rely too much on that one piece, and we need to get back into the mode of how do we actually command and control, not just with the network properly, but how do we do it without a network. And lastly, one example <clears throat> is I was in Israel a couple weeks ago, and what just really fascinated me was they're not, they're not really so concerned with the network per se. They're actually more concerned with the command and control programs that ride the network. What they've done, <clears throat> and they call it the crystal ball, is they've taken all their warfighting command and control programs, such as what we use, just I'll use ours as an example, like CPOF or C2PC or AFADS or GCSS Marine Corps or GCCC, uh, TBMCS. They've taken all those major command and control programs and they call it the crystal, the, they call it the crystal ball. And they combine it down into one basic program. And from the time you're a private in the Army, Air Force, or Navy over there till you're a three or four star general, you have the same look and feel, same applications as you progress in rank. You get more access to different programs as you progress, but the look and feel of the devices from the handheld device all the way up into the generals sitting in the, and what is their equivalent of our Pentagon in Tel Aviv is it's the same program, same applications that they've used all their life. And we still have stovepipe systems and we're more worried about a Dagon network than we are about our programs and applications and securing the data and how we're gonna command and control. Thank you. Wow, okay, Derek, thank you. I think there's a couple things you just need to, we need to keep in context. So the first thing I'll tell you, there is no new money. There is less money. And, and the question that we have to focus on, whether we like it or not, is what are we going to spend money on? And we also have to, to echo into what the under said yesterday. Cyber is, is immature to where it's at. So right now, what we know about cyber, probably pretty easy to say you ought to spend a little more money on cyber, and we're going to do that. But, but the questions we've got to understand is, so we just put more money in cyber, that meant I just took money away from something I was going to do. Might be a Marine battalion, might be a plane on a ship, but somewhere that money had to come from something else. And the other thing, whether it's unfortunate or not, is true. We have to be able to put all risks in terms of resources, which is a fancy way to say you gotta put it in terms of money. Everything eventually will come down to money. That's why the Pentagon's in D.C. If it wasn't money, we could put it in Kansas. It, it is money. We have got to be able to understand what the risks is in terms of dollars. And that's not new for us, but it is new for this warfare area. And I will tell you the other thing that complicates this warfare area, we are behind in understanding what cyber means in terms of cyber economics because one warfare area that's going to have more impact on the rest of the economy is cyber. We don't know how to measure that yet. So when you talk about risk inside DOD, you're also talking about risk in many cases that are out there for the private sector. That's gonna cost us money too, and how do we measure that? might be cost avoidance, says you have to do it, might be as Kevin says, you've got to change your technologies, you've got to focus less on that more there, but we got to get that answer and it's not just going to be a DOD answer. That has to be a national answer to how we're going to handle that problem and what level of security is required by, for what level of data. It is not all the same. There's some data, frankly, we don't care about, it can go, might actually be valuable if the threat had it, it might confuse them as much as it confuses us. We've got to have those conversations about where the data needs to be protected, what level it needs, and understand it in terms of money. Just like we're gonna tell you all, money 
is just going to shift. It's going to move between cyber and some other place. In your case, it's going to, you know, people ask me today, I'm at a floor, so how do I get more business? The ugly answer is the only way you get more business out of the Don is take it from somebody else's business. That is the only answer because there's no new money. <laughs> so how do you, if you're in a business, help me understand the risks in cyber and then put your value proposition that says moving money to you gives me a better value return in terms of reducing the risk, producing more effective cyber results, and that could be whatever Bob or Kevin would define them as as the operators, and leaves me with a better cyber position for less money in the end, or maybe even more exact, it leaves me with the right cyber position at the right cost. Because the other thing that I will tell you that we're willing to do today, if, if you would grant me that say today I spend whatever I spend and it meets 100% of my business requirements to include whatever security requirements I have. Today, we're willing to have a conversation that says, if you can come in and meet 90% of my requirements, depending on what 90 you meet, and you can do it for 60% on that dollar, come on down. We're willing to have the discussion. That is the financial environment that we are in. I would also offer in the short term, we're going to make some very short-term decisions that are not going to be good in the long term. So an ugly way to put it, but how can you help me make the least dumb decisions quicker? It is where we're at. We're going to do some things in the short term that don't make sense. So how do we do that? Because it's a cash flow issue, just like in business. You've, you've heard, you heard the under, you heard Abel Winnefeld, I think you will all be greatly entertained by the Commandant and the uh, CNO tomorrow on what they're going to say, the position we are in, in terms of the finances. So how do you help me, even in cyber, make the best wrong decisions? In the, the short term, when I say wrong, please keep in contact. We have to make them. There is a cash flow issue. There's a savings issue. We're going to have to get to if all of this happens, the sequestration and the CR. And it will force us to make some immediate decisions that will have long-term consequences. We need to understand that, and we need to understand what are the best ones to make that, that you wouldn't make them in any other financial situation, but you're going to make them today. How do you do that? Um, what makes, you know, what gives me the, the best return on cash for the lowest long-term pain? Enough said. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Rob? Thanks, Herb. Um, so this is like deja vu all over again. I remember sitting in this room <clears throat> when I had Terry's job, and I, I think I, one of my opening remarks was, uh, where do I invest my next 10 bucks in cyber, and what do I get for it? And I think Terry just illustrated that dilemma of, A, the next 10 bucks is a hard thing to come by, and B, I don't know that we know what we get for where we have invested, a.k.a. what's the payoff, what's the ROI? So we end up taking risk-based decisions and we invest in things we actually don't know what we get for it. Um, when, when we move to the joint information environment, again, that's a, a huge transformational activity that does require resources. And as Terry and uh, everybody else in the panel here has illuminated, that thing called money is becoming extremely uh, uh, short in, in supply. And while the cyber budget may be going ever so slightly up in tick, it's a relative thing compared to everything else that's coming down. And as Terry said as well, uh, it's coming from somewhere else, right? Somebody's given up something. Um, you know, moving to standardize is really about getting to that efficient place, getting to the place where we understand that General Alexander can see to the desktop, that I can do things more efficiently and effectively with the network, that I, that I, I agree with Kevin. This is really about mission assurance. Uh, here, here's the thing we also don't measure, speed to decision, right, and accuracy of decision. We don't measure, um, we trust that information that shows up on our screen inherently. And whether we should or we shouldn't is, a different, uh, is another argument. But I would offer to you that uh, as private uh, first class Manning is on trial right now, the post WikiLeaks reforms have cost the government, I would venture to say in the billions of remedies to, to begin to fix the things that should have been in place in the first place, some were policy, but some were real life technologies, 
that again buys down the risk of the cost of losing information, right? Or not having it at the ready when the commander needs it. So I think that there's an opportunity here to have the discussion about, uh, I hate to use the term metrics, but, but for lack of a better word, we don't have an X over Y. We can't, you know, every vendor that's come in to visit me in the last couple of years has started to get that question. What did I get if I bought your tool and I deployed it across this three and a half million person enterprise? And I get, you know, the BD guys are all looking at salivating, there's a check coming, but the, the engineer's going, hmm, hmm. Because I haven't thought about it in the way that it is an additive, what did I get by investing in that tool? Uh, now, now, Bob talked about the workforce. Here's another thing, as we move towards things like continuous monitoring in cyber, so the tools will keep an eye on the network and the, the need for humans in the loop can go down. It won't go away and the tools are investments, right? So back to Terry's comment, <coughs> this is why I hate being the last guy because everybody said everything already. Um, the, the, the investments are necessary to get to the place where we have this assured network, this, this information dominance that we desire, that we talk about, but that we have to live it, right? Whether you're out on, on the bow of a ship or you're in a, a rifle platoon in Kandahar or Hellman province, whatever, you gotta have information you trust coming off the network when you need it. And you gotta have bandwidth to do that. All that stuff costs money to, to deliver and then how do I actually make it better holistically from an enterprise perspective? When I had Terry's job, we sort of pushed the Big E Enterprise in the Don, and now you're hearing the Big E Enterprise being pushed in the DOD, ostensibly because it will be better, faster, cheaper once we get there, but there's a whole lot of transformation that has to occur to get to that point. So I'll stop there and we can start with the audience questions. Okay, while you, somebody's <coughs> walking up to ask the first question, I'm gonna ask a question. I, I think it was marvelous remarks and you know some key I'm sure we all have a, a list of bullets, but cultural changes certainly is something that we need to think about. And, the, and command and control mission assurance, we, that, that was a strong point. You know, the idea that money is neither created nor destroyed is just moved from one place to another comes through loud and clear. And the fact that the market is, is less rather than greater. What is the ROI? Marvelous question everyone in this room ought to be thinking about. Speed to decision is key. As I collect those thoughts, I, I sat there and the, I, I, I had to ask myself is, I'll ask the panel, is uh, an increase in security going to decrease our ability to move information? In other words, does it, does it shrink the stove pipe? Does it, does, it, does it prevent us from being able to move information at the rate that our warfighters anticipate that they're gonna be, that they need? Yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> okay, good. So, I mean, you know, I, you, some of you heard me tell the story before, but in, in a previous life, you know, I was part of an experiment that said we were going to encrypt the, uh, the, the spec op radios. So, you know, I could yell to Kevin, duck. But by the time the encryption took place, Kevin didn't need to duck anymore. You know, I needed a different instrument to remove Kevin from the battlefield. So it could. I mean, part of what we've got to understand is, is the security keeping pace with the demand for the data and what's the time relativity of the data? There is some data that's so perishable, you could argue, does it need any protection at all? I would argue that the field radio is pretty good. The enemy knows where I am or they wouldn't be shooting at me. And, and so maybe I don't need to protect that very well. And as you step back, okay, more and more maybe protection, but you really are gonna to have to guard against, you, you, we had a discussion a couple days ago about how secure can you make the network. I can secure the network 100% today. Not, and I can do it for almost no money. I just disconnect it. Now, that causes some downside um, to people. <laughs> but it is perfectly secure. So we really are gonna to have to ask ourselves that question, what data, to Kevin's point, what data, gonna to have to understand our data much better than we are today. Industry's gonna to have to understand our data because I would, the other thing we get a lot of is, here is the answer. There is no single answer. You gotta bring us a variety of solutions and options to include options for tiered security. 
Anybody else? Y'all are going to listen to me all afternoon. Okay. Thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Um, my question, I guess, is for the, the whole panel regarding uh, General spoke a little bit about um, as far as securing applications and what's being done to kind of consolidate amongst either within the services or in the, um, within one service or between the services to take similar applications and maybe make them more secure and work for multiple agencies. I said Rob's job jar. Well, I can, I can <laughs> okay. start off, but first off, when, are you, when you are ready to change duty stations, you can come work for me, because that's a good question. No, he's going to work for me. <laughs> we'll talk before you do that. No, I mean, that's a good, that's a good question, but I'll tell you what we are doing with, uh, in conjunction with the Department of Navy and the Navy as an operating force, is we have a facility out in Kansas City, Missouri, called McKeats. It's a Marine Corps Enterprise IT Service Center. And that's our private cloud environment, and we've already started moving programs and applications in and there. And recently, um, Mr. Halverson agreed, and we've been working this for a couple of years, but Spa War, Charleston, San Diego, and New Orleans have now designated that as their coop site. So it's not that they'll use our IT equipment, but they'll use the, the facility, the, the space, if you will, in there for a coop site. So we're working real closely with the Navy. I've offered that space up as part of the JIE, the Joint Information Environment, to the other services because we do have excess space in there. We are locked in to that facility through 2017. Uh, it has been designated as an enterprise data center for the JIE environment. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's what we're doing in the Navy Marine Corps side of the house to consolidate and protect our applications and programs. So, so at, the, at the DOD level, as we move towards JIE, there is a huge effort to consolidate apps and, and within each functional community. So there actually aren't that many defense enterprise applications. There are a great number in Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps that are Navy specific, Marine Corps specific, what have you. But each of them, uh, each of the services are working to define those. But the, as, as Kevin and, and Terry have mentioned, the data that they engage and making the data visible and accessible to the resultant app that will live forever is really the important work that has to be done here. And it has to live in a data center that will meet a set of standards that today most of our data centers don't meet, right? So it is understanding and thinking about the long haul, the work that has to be done, the applications have to engage what data and the identities that are gonna uh, be accessing those applications and data with what rights and authorities. So it is part of the future, but I will tell you, we're at the front end of that journey, not at the back end of the journey, saying this is how many we killed. The number of applications, and I think in Navy, we've been at this, what, seven, eight, nine years, uh, application rationalization, shooting applications as they drive by, and then they, they pop up somewhere else. Um, at the end of the day, the number of apps that live on, I mean, they really do need to be a discipline about building them. But in your generation, you can build an app for a phone on a weekend, but it's really more about the data, right? So it's not about that. I actually want to make lighter and lighter apps and I want to have them in a data store or in an app store to engage a cloud of data that is authoritative. That's the, the paradigm shift that has to go on from thousands of, of heavy-duty applications with their own data to a data store. Yeah, and it gets into that point that uh, we talked about uh, earlier is this is a culture shift, and it's going to take a long time. I mean, we don't even know what our inventories are totally. I mean, I can't tell you, you know, every day I find a new application in the Coast Guard that I had no clue about that was developed. And it gets back to what Terry said, hey, we can't have all of them, but if it meets 60 to 70 percent of your requirements and we can standardize on it and only have a couple, but it still gets most of the job done and we only have to support a security environment for that, then that's the way we've got to go, particularly with the pressures that we're having now. And so it gets into this portfolio management and this new discipline that's going to have to occur. And eventually, again, it will work out a lot better because instead of uh, right now, I've got eight or nine different project management systems out there. And it, the word is, well, I have unique requirements. Um, and when you start tearing into them, mm, they're not so unique. And uh, again, that 60, 70% piece and managing the data more so 
um, versus I need it presented this way versus presented that way, uh, we start talking about some different semantics there. The only thing I would add for all of the vendors, customization bad, out of the box good. Sir, before I ask you, let me do a quick follow on, and I'm sure with my follow on that Kevin's not going to invite me to work for him. So let me ask you this. Uh, can, can we have speed to capability and configuration management? How, how do we, if you see something on that exhibit floor, or if you see something in your travels that, that is going to make a difference, can you do that speed to capability? and maintain configuration management to a satisfactory level? No, and the reason I say that is, is because it's the acquisition piece. That's, if I had acquisition authority, there's a brief I just took right before I came here. If I had the acquisition authority to do that, sir, I could, I'd buy that product today and put it on my network. And Doesn't Colin Klinger and I would give save, you something? Pardon me? Doesn't Colin Klinger give you something? Aren't, aren't there? I have no acquisition authority. Okay. I have to go through Syscom, and then it's, and I'm not, I'm just saying the way it is. I'm not complaining or whining, I'm, but it's fair and open competition. Well, we're not going to fix acquisition in here. So, 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 Herb, I guess I would say that, you know, if, and I would, you know, agree to disagree with Kevin a little bit. If, if we know what our requirements are, and, and some people talk in IT, and IT and requirements don't actually jive, but if we knew what we wanted, and we knew it would scale to the environment that we wanted to use this tool in, we can make decisions pretty quickly. That's, I completely but, but it's, disagree but it, with you. It okay. takes 18 months to 24 months to get something through the acquisition process that you need. And the, my problem with that is, and it gets, does relate to cybersecurity. For example, if I got a router or a switch go bad, it could be a Cisco, Brocade, Juniper, Palo Alto, pick one. I may not get the same router. So now I got to reconfigure the network because I got a different routing protocols. So that's reality. Okay, sir. Thank you, uh, Scott Kinner uh, with the Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. I'm gonna wait a minute. This, this okay. gentleman used to work for me. He's really smart. Yeah, oh, but, well, I'm not, but I'm not yeah. a ringer. Uh, no softball coming at I mean, you, sir. So, yeah, uh, and it's not. I'm not answering it. Unless you buy me dinner, uh, you're not getting a softball, sir. So. I'm just going to throw this out. Though. Kevin's really, really smart. smart. Maybe a low bar. You mean as opposed <laughs> to the last question? <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, Bring it on. I, I'm going to throw a little bit of a. Uh, a little bit of a curveball at the, at the cybersecurity bit, which uh, in another place I was at, we had a discussion, and one of the things we kind of came up with was this focus on cybersecurity has more or less made us, you know, cyber fobbits, for lack of a better term, for those few uh, forward operating base, you never leave the forward operating base, you become a fobbit. And we kind of had this, we have this big file that we call cybersecurity. We have HESCO barriers and all sorts of things. We're very, very focused on protecting everything inside. My question to the panel, and, and it's not about particular programs or something, is, but I'm interested in getting outside the wire eventually. And it seems to me that if I, if I go outside the wire to operate in the cyber environment, some of the stuff I, I, I'm taking with me uh, is coming out of the FOB. So how, how, how can I operate in the environment? How can I operate outside the FOB? I hope that makes sense. Well, it does, but in cyber, you're already operating you're already out outside there. the FOB. So are you op your question may be better, are we operating well outside okay, the FOB? I'll, I'll take that, because the, yeah. the, the, real, the feel of the group yeah. was, our, and we're not, we're neophytes. So from our, from our standpoint, it was like, wow, I spent a lot of time worried about protecting this and protecting yep. that, and that, but I'm being told we need to be moving outside in the environment. And I understand that merely being there, I'm in the environment, um, but being in the environment and leaving the fob are two different things. That was the analogy. I, I can be in the desert and still in a fob. I want to get outside that. Well, I would argue, you'd say you're, you're, outside the, the, outside. you're outside the fob. There is no fob. I mean, it, you, you're, 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 you can be, because you can be accessed anywhere, and you can impact anywhere. But are we good at that? That's an interesting But, Scott, question. that's a good, I mean, I, under, I, I, I understand. I think I completely understand your analogy. It's a good analogy. You taught me well, sir. That's why. Yeah. You kept me out of trouble. It's but getting, the, uh, it's getting deep up here. Especially with SCADA, Scott, the SCADA environment. I mean, if you look at it based on your analogy, which I really like because it's a good Marine Corps analogy, is when you go outside the FOB, it's how do you protect against IEDs? So you could relate an IED into a cyber attack or a malware attack or a zero-day zero exploit, and how do you ensure that your data that you just hit send on is actually getting to the right person at the right time in the right format and not corrupted. 
per se. And, and what's the nature of a cyber patrol? In other words, I'm going outside and operating well, that, in an environment. Yeah. What am I looking for? How am I reporting on that? What, what information am I pulling? And how does that work with the systems we have on, on we, online? I mean, you're right. But at an unclassified level, I'll tell you yeah. that that's being worked. And successfully. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Antoine Ford. Um, Admiral Day, last year I paid a visit with you with Admiral Brown and you showed me some very creative things regarding protecting um, the devices that many of us are carrying today. And I know you talked about DHS being able to set the standards for them to being able to, to protect iPads and many of these devices. Um, how have or has some of the standards for protecting these in the other um, uh, organizations uh, been in terms of standards? Because it's often as we try to go and talk to the various commands, they have different ways of protecting the devices. Some would say no, some would say bring your own devices, and some would say we don't know yet. You see, where's, uh, <laughs> where's DISA? Huh? I was going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one because it's like my holy grail question. Yeah, because uh, we're all demanded on it. So uh, I would tell you that th there are a great number of uh, standards out there for mobile devices based upon the FISMA law and how NIST has interpreted that. And I would tell you today, you know, there are some people out there that have certain manufactured devices and they've got certain third party software on them and they're declaring that to be good to go. And the DAAs can actually do that, right? Because Bob's got one. Yeah, I got one. However, comma, you're, there's risk, back to that risk equation that you're taking. So today, you know, we're, we, DISA, are working on defining that bar in simple terms. What does the device have to be able to do? No more, no less. There's a combination of the commercial off-the-shelf device, probably some third-party software, and I'll call it the ecosystem, right, that we'll have set up that will allow us to now use the mobile devices, these smartphones, which are just exploding mm -hmm. uh, leaps and bounds, to carry uh, nipper, sipper, and most likely TS-type data around on them. Today, uh, Bob's device, if you're using it as a pilot, you're probably okay. If you declared it to be the answer, you're probably on the other side of the risk equation. The other manufacturers are all trying to get in that space, and you know, DIS is working on um, MDM RFP, which I think went out on the street. But, but the bottom line is to be able to use a state-of-the-art phone inside of certainly DOD is where we're headed, and we expect to be there uh, by the fall having choices instead of uh, what we have today. The standard, the benchmark is RIM, and RIM is a perfectly acceptable device to use, and the BB-10s will come out uh, what, the next day or so if they're not already yeah. out? So um, uh, be able to actually buy one and hold one. But, but it, it's, a big, it's a big deal for us to do it, A, consistently mm -hmm. across the services and make sure that, again, the device is a protected element. If we were all using thin clients, it's a different problem, but we're not. That client is actually holding on to data that is FOUO slash CUI, <coughs> and you got to protect it adequately. Those standards are defined. I'm trying to put a, a bow around them and then be able to hand it to anybody that wants it and, it, and they can make sense of the, you know, from the 100 NISC, FIPS, mm -hmm. one, whatever documents into a list of requirements, you can say, I do this, if that helps you. Okay, you. Admiral Mackey. I'm Dick Mackey, I am so old, <laughs> I taught her brown. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, I think many people agree that the opening shot of the next war will be a cyber shot. Uh, could be against our banking system, could be against uh, the electrical power distribution system. All of that's devastating. It doesn't affect our military. What will affect our military is when they attack our command and control system. What can we do to, <coughs> one, defend against the unknown because the attack that will come is an unknown attack. And secondly, what can we do to ensure that we have whatever capability we need to reconstitute in some way, shape, or form immediately our command and control so we don't lose the battle on the first day? Can I uh, just answer the first, one of the first pieces that you said there is that uh, uh, the critical infrastructure piece and things like that aren't really going to be a, a problem for us in the military. I disagree. Um, let me look at my specialty being maritime critical infrastructure. What if I can close all the bridges um, at a port of out embarkation and an outload port, which can be done? 
such that the bridge will never go up because most of them are industrial control systems. We also have to look at that. Is it a major factor? Um, yeah, uh, probably not as big, but it, again, uh, that critical infrastructure in our nation which directly supports um, our ability to prepare for and re ready to execute missions, um, it's something that we have to take a look at. So it's an element, and I'll pass the command and control piece to uh, my brother. So, Admiral, um, since the C2 for DOD is in my portfolio, um, and there's a great answer I could give you, but not in this room. Um, suffice to say that building in resiliency, building in identity, and linking the two, the data and the, and the individual over a resilient network is how we intend to ensure C2 availability. Now, again, not much else I can say in a, in a, in a general uh, audience like this, but happy to talk in another room at length. But I think there's another part of the equation we need to bring in. So many of us looking at this room um, are, are veterans of the Cold War calculus that said that at one time, you know, we were investing and the, the evil block was going to overrun us and they could do all those things. And in the end, Military power certainly played a role in defeating the, the Cold War evildoers, but so did economics. Cyber will play an even bigger role in economics. So I would argue if I was going to launch my first cyber attack, it wouldn't be against infrastructure, it wouldn't be against the military, it would be against the economic abilities of a nation, and that's pretty easy to do. That would impact all of us quickly. The other thing I think we have to remember, we do tend to do the cyber exercises in kind of this environment that says we didn't do anything to stop it and we wouldn't do anything to counter it. We just let it happen and that's not going to happen either. So I do think you have to take the whole cyber problem much like all warfare areas. You can't separate cyber and say it's the only equation. It has to be part of the total warfare and the total economic package that you understand. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Admiral. My name is Carl Cecil with Schneider Electric. And last year, you couldn't hardly go to a, a uh, forum like this that you didn't hear about data center consolidation. And I haven't heard much about that. You briefly talked about a coop site. But I read an article where Mr. Halverson, uh, in Signal Magazine, you know, it was a couple months ago, where you said, you know, we've closed a few data centers down, but I want to get the 150 or whatever the number was down to a single digit number. So kind of curious how the budget impact is, is, is affecting your plans to do that because clearly it costs money to do it, but obviously there'll be great savings at the end. And uh, clearly that's a, it's, you know, still an important thing, but so I'd be curious how the, this budget impact is, is impacting and what's the way forward? You're not trying to give you a, 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 a crap answer. I don't know yet. Um, you know, it really does depend on just how bad does all of this happen. I will tell you inside the Department of Navy, we're doing what we can to protect the investment required to shut down the data centers. Marine Corps has done very well in moving forward in reducing data centers. Navy had a little bigger target area. Um, they're, they're, they're starting to move faster. So we're, we're kind of at meeting the goal. But yeah, obviously if we, if we start getting to the point where they're, they're, we're sacrificing ship availabilities and mission, yeah, we're gonna take data center money too. So I don't know yet. It, it really will be interesting to see uh, just what we end up having to do. Now the plus side could be if I cut everything else, won't need the data. So maybe I just, you know, close them all. And because and, there's nobody around or nobody needing the data. There could be a bright side. Very secure, though. It'd be very secure, too, yes. Okay. So just pull the plug. Okay, thank you. I'm not through yet. Uh, the, the, uh, I, and and this, this may be unfair, but Scuttlebutt that I've heard uh, suggests that Cybercom is going to grow to around 5,000 people. Uh, that is a cost. Do you see this increase in staff size reducing risk? Yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I will keep saying this. I think the answer is do we need to, cyber's immature. I think right now you could make a pretty good equation that says yes. Do we need some more cyber capability? Is that a good investment? Yes. So I think this first round of investment is, makes sense. Does the next round of investment make sense? That's where we're really going to have to understand all of the impacts because, as again, that whatever that next round of investment is, it's going to come from something else that we think is pretty important because we, we have neck down. There's, there's, there, there is not, despite what you may read, these big gaps that we could just say, hey, let's just write this off. These, this group of people or this capability is no longer important. Um, that is gone. We have really gotten down to, to where we, we're paying for the capabilities that we need. So it is now trade space and capability. And the next round of cyber investments, if we don't understand it better and can't put that math and the risk math on the table, again, in the total picture of what it takes to go and do our mission, and our mission is war. So it's not, we got to stop saying cyber as an independent area. It is an important warfare area. So is all of the other warfare areas. And what we're not good at yet is how do you combine all the warfare areas, measure the risk of subtracting or adding in any of those warfare areas, and what is the result? That, that's a complicated math problem, but we better get good at it quicker. Yeah, and the other piece is, is the efficient, you know, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to trade off some of these efficiencies that we're going to save you money and reinvest that? Because generally every efficiency that I've ever dealt with over the last three years is just give me the money. But I want to invest, give me 50% and let me invest the other 50%. But today it's like, no, I want all of it and uh, not investing for the future. So some of these efficiencies, they're going to have to maybe do a trade off to say if you want to invest there and take the people that we're going to get from data center consolidations and some of these uh, transitions and transition them into cyber warriors. And I think that's the new workforce, but uh, you got to allow us to be able to invest in the future. I remember the question about efficiency was uh, how many additional people do I need to hire to operate this labor-saving device? Uh, the, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I'd just like to ask the panel members, any wrap-up Bob? Well, I, I, you know, you've All heard the theme of the we don't know about the budget impacts, but you know, just note to all of yourselves that they will be severe. The stand-up of the Cyber Command folks were all from somewhere else. I mean, they were all zero-sum game. There, nobody plussed anybody up. They moved from somewhere else. Um, and I can remember having uh, the argument with Fleet Forces Command. As a matter of fact, Admiral Daly, uh, you know, don't ask me for any more people to go up to Fort Meade right now because I'm not manning ships at the level I need to man ships. That's an important distinction. Everybody has to give somewhere. So as we move into this future, the cyber defense and the cyber offensive part is a, somewhat of a nascent capability in DOD, but it's growing in leaps and bounds. We recognize its importance, and as Terry said, it, it fits with everything else. It's not its own area. We don't do uh, uh, aviation in a vacuum. We do aviation in the midst of every other uh, <clears throat> war fighting area that's going on. So I think that, uh, you know, back to, to what we were talking about at the beginning, the balance of cost and risk, we know the cost curve isn't remaining uh, at the level it's been in the past. It's going to go down. Ergo, the, the prudent investments are going to be necessary to drive the risk as low as possible, but suffice to say, risk will be there. There isn't enough money to print it printed to turn our networks into these absolutely pristine, secure network environments, short of what, what Terry said is turn them off, right? If the computers become boat anchors, they're really secure. Otherwise, if we're using them and we're, and we're running over the internet, uh, even encrypted, we run risks. So, so we need, you know, industry's great ideas and the government folks in the audience great ideas on how to reduce the risk to national security. Yes, sir, go ahead. Question, have you hired computer hacks to attempt to hack into your system? Sir, did you say, did we hire computer hackers to try and hack into our systems? Yes. Well, yeah, I have a red team. Um, I have a blue team. I have a green team. Say so it again. I have a red team, that that's their sole function in life is to go and try and get into my networks. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, Silicon Valley and other places. 
There's some of these guys are really young kids are really expert at it. That's the only well, that's question. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, my red team is composed of 90% civilians. Yeah, the, the red teams that we have, just so you know, when they go play, uh, they're sort of like the, the Celtics of the 60s. They're the dynasty. There is, they can always generally find a way in, which is, you know, when you're out at the edge operating the network, it's very difficult to plug every single hole that you have because you don't have the resources to do it. <laughs> So the red teams go out and, and sort of, you know, get in and then help people figure out how to fix, and every service has them, and as well as NSA and Cyber Command. Any other wrap-ups? I, I personally, every time that, that I have the opportunity to do this, I get excited about the leadership we have uh, in government. Uh, if, if these guys and their teams can't solve it, then it's not going to be solved anywhere. So I. Hopefully you feel as good as I do. They're really, really great at what they do. Plus, they'll look you in the eye and they give you frank answers. Maybe not the answer you wanted to hear, but I'm a big fan of all four of them, and you should be too. Thank you, guys. Thank you.